Hello fellow woodworkers and makers of great things. Uh, welcome to my shop. I'm going to do a, a new video and I'm going to take a little different twist on it. Um, a lot about what we do when we create and make things uh, is, is, is more than just a, a process of, uh, you know, assembling joints and, and putting something together. It, it, it's a journey, right? It starts with some uh, need or inspiration um, to accomplish something. Um, and sometimes there are practical elements where um, the thing you're making has to meet certain criteria um, uh, to, to get done what you need done. So today I'm, I'm going to take you from the beginning to the end. We're going to start from uh, the inspiration, uh, sketching things out, figuring out how things should be going together, what size things should be. Um, and, and instead of bringing you to putting the piece together, we're going to grab the uh, we're going to grab the rough stock. We're going to see where we're going to get our parts from. We're going to mill stock. We're going to plane. We're going to joint. We're going to rip. We're going to size. We're actually going to cut the joints and bring the whole thing together. So um, it's going to be a longer video. I, I may break it up into into two parts. I don't know yet, but. Um, it's not going to be a quick, uh, you know, 10, 20 minute uh, video here. Um, so, you know, I hope you enjoy it. You know, I hope you, you want to stay with it and, and watch it through. If you don't, that's fine. <laughs> We're not all, all the same. But, you know, what I would appreciate is, um, you know, take a look and, and tell me in the comments. Is this the kind of format that you like? Um, or is this something that uh, is just a, a little too extended? So, um, you know, give me your thoughts. Let me know what you think. And uh, I hope you enjoy this video. Thanks. Hey guys, today I'm going to uh, embark on a pretty uh, practical project. Uh, welcome to the shop. Um, for years I've had this little neat box here uh, in which I kept uh, all my wiring and soldering supplies and I had this for a long time. But uh, the problem is we're a bit at over capacity. We've got more crap in here than I can uh, fit. And uh, if I pan back, you'll be able to see I've got a lot more stuff I'd like to put in there. I'd like to make this more of an uh, electrical box for, uh, you know, light electronics, not, not, not household wiring. I've got, I've got an electrician kit for that. But uh, looking to do something for, uh, you know, automotive and, um, you know, uh, uh, small engine power equipment that I do a lot of. Um, always, always needing to... Um, to do something electrical it seems these days so um, I've got all this wiring and soldering stuff in here but you know I'd like to get more room and organize this stuff for example here's a brand new test light I just bought because I can't find my other test light now Murphy's Law says that that'll show up any day now that I bought the new one but you know about a bunch of stuff I've got this little guy you plug into your car get the code for what's wrong uh, some spark testers, a battery uh, checker that I haven't even used yet, and i got to get that and, uh, on the generator, make sure i got enough cold cranking amps this winter, but uh, i got to get around to that. A little tachometer, uh, two multi-testers, I probably don't need them, but uh, the one on the right is auto-ranging, so I got it because it was a bit of a whim, and I'd say, well, that'd be neat to have. Um, just some, some crimping tools and the like, uh, more, <laughs> more crimp on fasteners than I need. Uh, a little confession, I had a, a box of them. I forgot I had a box of them. I bought another box of them. Uh, and then, you know, you need some right angle connectors, so you get those. And and then I bought a new crimping tool over here. And with that new crimping tool came uh, another, I think, 800-piece <laughs> connector set. So I've got a lifetime of connectors. I'm not sure I want them all in the new box anyway. But we got to build a box. And that box should be able to accommodate uh, as much of the crap on the table as, as you see. And I don't know that I've got everything yet. Like I said, I know I've got one more test light somewhere around here that's going to show up. So uh, one of the, the, the limitations to it is that I've, I've got limited space for it. So let's, let's take a look outside the shop. Now my shop is where I keep all my woodworking tools. And, and out here on the other half of the garage, I've got a little workspace where I have my uh, my mechanics tools. Uh, I got a tool bag for my you know just daily jobs around the house, something I can grab and run with. But I got a shelf on the bottom of this cabinet. I don't know if the light's picking that up. Let's put some light on here. That's a little better. So what I'd like to do is get that new box to fit in here. 
and that's going to give me about 19 inches that way. I better take an inch off, make that 18, and it's going to give me about. Oh, sorry about the camera. It's going to give me about six and a half inches that way. And if I'm going to get it in and out of there, I guess I can make it about. Uh, I think eight inches tall is plenty, plenty big. I can go tall. Looks like I can go up to at least ten inches there. So, so that's my place for it, and that's my restrictions. So let's get. Um, Let's get back in the shop. I want to take everything out of that box, lay it out, and see if I could sketch out a plan. So stay tuned. And we're back. So what I did was I, I took uh, and outlined the dimensions of the box on some drafting paper here. Uh, 18 by 6 and a half using half inch stock, which reduces my interior dimensions by an inch uh, all around. Um, and started laying out some things and getting some ideas and my first idea is I think I'm going to put a tool tray on the top of the box and that will hold uh, these tools so if the box is say eight inches tall uh, the, the top uh, I don't know inch and a half or whatever we'll measure that to be will be a tool tray that will, will hold some of these uh, um, tools at, at, at ready reach um, and then I think I'll create a hollow lid as well. And I can put some electronic testing equipment up there um, uh, into the, the hollow of the lid. And just to give you an example, here's my drafting box over here. And you can get an idea of what I'm talking about. So that, that box uh, has a, a hollow lid. And those, those rules are just held up there by magnets. Uh, but it, it gives me some quick access to them. And I think that, that kind of a... Um, a system would work well on the uh, electronics box too, except to capture all those devices back there. I'd have to put some kind of a panel in front with a quick release so I can take it off. Ooh, plexiglass maybe, uh, so I uh, don't forget what I got back there. Uh, and then just some tabs or something that I can remove it in uh, a matter of seconds and get to those those tools. So so that's what I'm thinking for the top uh, lid of the box, and we'll we'll we'll, we'll do some of that. And I don't really have. I'd like to get you know one of my test lights uh, and one of my um, and, and this little mini uh, soldering iron uh, heat source that's great to have handy for shrink shrinking tubes and stuff like that but look what I found my other test light <laughs> of course it was in the wiring and soldering box down in the bottom and I didn't find it because frankly I forgot it was uh, amber <laughs> so I was looking for something that looked like that and I guess I saw the bottom of that box and I, I, I saw amber and black and I didn't realize it was the, uh, the test light buried in there. So, well, now I got my two test lights, Andy. Uh, I'm sure everybody needs two test lights, right? A um, couple of other executive decisions. One is this uh, multimeter that I've had that is not auto ranging. Uh, it's not going in the kit. I think I'll give that to my son-in-law or something. I, I don't, can't say I need two multimeters. I'll, I'll keep my fancy new auto ranging uh, jobber here uh, as well. So, um, and then the second executive decision I made was six and a half isn't wide enough. I'm going to go eight. And if that means I have to reconfigure the bottom shelf of this tool cabinet uh, over here, then then so be it. I mean, uh, you know, I, th I think that one box on the left just has, you know, wire brushes and stuff. Uh, and then I got my grinder. And, and its accessories and on the end there that's actually a, um, a, a pistol grip soldering iron which I never use so maybe I don't need that um, you know maybe that doesn't belong there I can't remember the last time I used the the pistol grip uh, soldering iron uh, for anything so I'll, I'll figure that out and I think this guy would be pretty manageable if it was 18 inches long 8 inches wide and maybe 9 inches deep now since I'm going to do that lid thing and then I'll have the storage in the lid up here. I'll have the tool tray on top of it. And that will say it takes about three inches. I'll still have six inches below that. Or I can put all this miscellaneous uh, crap. The other thing is, in order to get this, this, uh, this tool tray, um, there really needs to be some type of divider strip running down it so you've got something to grab to remove the tool tray. You can't just have the tool tray sitting there and no quick and easy way to pull it up to get the stuff underneath it so we'll need to create a little uh, a little space right 
and if I've got a little space, then I can put something, you know, across the middle here. Uh, you know, it's just the height of the tray um, that I would be able to grab and remove the tray uh, when I need to. So I think that's the, the plan. One multimeter, uh, a tool tray, um, a, uh, a lid uh, that will capture the uh, electronic test stuff. Uh, and uh, let's get going. I'm going to go with half inch um, thickness. It doesn't need it. It could be less. But what I realized when I was looking at my drafting box was the hardware. You need to screw in, you know. So this is half inch and it, 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 it holds it pretty securely. You put a lot of tension on these guys. Um, you know, and then the hinges back here uh, work well with half inch stock. Um, you know, the hold downs. Uh, I'm going to go with a handle like that and the lid because it kind of presses down flat when you need it, but you can you can pick up the box pretty easily. So I think that's kind of going to be the same type of uh, a deal. Uh, I am not going to use finger joints or dovetails or anything. I'm, I'm thinking this is going to be a simple butt joint glued and nailed. Um, and we'll take it from there. And this is what I meant by the dividing strip on the tool tray. You need something that you can grab so that you can lift this thing out of here. Uh, this half tool tray is easy enough to move, but this bigger one, you want something that you can grab and pull up and access the bottom of the, of the tray. So that's what we're going to do. And uh, let's mill some half inch stock and, uh, and get this thing cranking. So I got uh, one board in, in the thickness planer just setting in there and I'm just touching the rollers. I can just feel a little resistance so I know that's a, a good starting point uh, to get going. Uh, what I'm going to do is take this board out. Now because I was just touching I'm going to take this down a full turn. And that should just nick it on the first pass. We'll give it a try. I want you to see that I've got my uh, dust collector uh, connected to uh, the planer uh, with a four inch hose. Uh, blast gate open. All the other blast gates in the shop are closed. And we're bringing it into that two, hour, two horsepower uh, dust collector over there. So let me get you set up in the tripod and we will um, we'll plane some wood. And it might be noise. This is hearing protector work. So. smaller planers. Just don't ask too much of it. Take your time.
can still see uh, a little bit of pencil mark. Let's get this camera adjusted. I can still see some pencil mark left on that uh, second board, the longer one that I put through, which means it is not yet flat and parallel to the other side. So I need another pass on that side to get everything uh, uh, nice and even. So we'll give each, each board uh, another pass. Exactly the same thickness, the surfaces are flat and they're parallel to each other. Um, the next thing we want to do is get to uh, our thickness, our half an inch thickness. So let's see if I can work with the camera here. Try to make sure you can see me. But I'm using a rule here. I'm going to check the thickness of my stock and right now I am still at a full three quarter inches so uh, I took the I took the extra off of those boards now we're going to take her down to a half inch and that's just a matter now of um, <coughs> alternately uh, flipping the boards so next time we'll take it off this first side we'll take off a pass we'll flip it we'll take off another pass and we'll just gradually work our way down to uh, the half inch that we're looking for. Let's get you set up again. Actually, I'm going to shut you off for a while. I'll get back to you at the end because you don't need to watch all this. Okay, so I've taken, uh, I, don't know, I think, four light passes on each board, uh, flipping it over each time, taking material off of the uh, opposite sides on each pass. And I'm down to where I'm very close to my, uh, my half inch thickness. So I'm going to take one more light pass off of each board and um, we should be where we want to be. Let's get And I am bed on the half inch mark, trying to get you some decent light here. So we got these two boards down to a half inch, nice and flat and uh, and true and and parallel on both sides. We got the best surfaces we can get out of these boards. Uh, a couple things I wanted to mention. One was I talked about flipping the board over on each pass of the planer, and the idea is that you're taking an equal amount of wood off of each side of the board. So if there are any internal stresses in the wood, or if the moisture count uh, is slightly different uh, uh, you know, within the, the thickness of the wood, you're trying to even that out as best you can. It's a good rule of thumb, but it is not an absolute, okay? Um, it doesn't matter here because again, this is a utilitarian piece. It's pine, if I, if I see knots, I don't care. It, it, it's gonna give it some character. Uh, if I was making a piece of fine furniture, I may come across a board and, and I don't know if I have one here. I do. Here's a knot that I might not want to show on a federal card table, for example. That's walnut or mahogany. Right? And I, don't, I probably don't want that, that, that on my work. On the other side of this board, I can barely see that knot. So I may want this to be the show side of my board. If that were the case, I would not have planed this side once I got it flat. 
because the more I plane this side, the more this knot from the other side is going to show through. So again, if this was a piece of fine furniture, I would have taken that into consideration and not plane this side of the board. I could have probably completely avoided even this little bit that came up to show now uh, by just carefully, um, you know, planing one side over the other. Just something to take into consideration. Again, if you're doing something that, you know, something like a, a toolbox, you know, you don't care, it's fine. But if this were going to be the top, again, of a federal card table, I, I might want to take care with that planing uh, sequence so that I don't reveal a knot on the clear side of the board. And then let's talk about snipe again. Remember I said you're always going to get snipe. And I've been using this planer for, I don't know, 15 years. And I, I can work it as best as it can be worked. But if we get down to the end of the board, and we put a pencil across here, look what you see. See that line? And again, that's that point. Roller, cutter, roller. That's the point. Travel the direction. That's the point where this board comes off of this roller. And again, great force is being removed from this roller. There's still great force pressed on this roller. There's going to be a kick. The machine doesn't have the mass to offset that force and it's going to reflect right here in terms of snipe. You might not ramp off the end of the board, right, because you know you're, you're, you know how to hold the board, you know how to, to keep it from, from ramping down uh, here, but at this line right here, that's what happened. Came off one high pressure roller, jerked just a little bit right there, and then it got back on track with the second roller, but this is what happened at that exact point. So that's, that's, that's my story on snipe i'm sticking with it i know there's guys on youtube and in articles who say boy if you build this extension table at a melamine and ramp it out three feet on each end and you'll never get snipe again baloney those three rollers are gonna are gonna torque and it's gonna cause a little bit of snipe i'm now gonna lay this out again lay my parts out again on the uh plain wood because uh, i obviously lost my marks uh, i'll account for the snipe and I will uh, be right back. And I've marked out the, uh, the parts now on the uh, finished uh, half inch stock. And um, first thing you'll notice at the end of each board is the snipe. All right, <laughs> got over that enough. Uh, I've got my front and my back. I've got two sides right there. I've got stock for tops and trays. I've got stocks for tops and trays. I got the clearest portion for the lid, and don't you know, our little inclusion showed up. But um, you know, we got the we got the the the, the, the minimized side, um, and then over here I've got some extra stock uh, at a half an inch, so uh, gives myself room to make a um, a mistake or two. Uh, and if I don't, I'm got a nice uh, half inch board around for some future project, which I'm sure it will come up fine. So let's do something first, and that is, if you see on this piece, I've got two different rip lines. Um, I've got to rip it here to get my seven inches for the sides in height, and uh, the lid is eight inches in height. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, rip this board, I'm, sorry, I'm going to cross cut this board down um, this line right here. And uh, this way I can rip this way, come back and rip this way, and not lose uh, any stock. So um, let's get set up with that. We'll rip, and then we can start uh, pulling the parts uh, out of this board. All right, I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to rip this board again. Uh, I'm going to have, I'm sorry, I'm going to cross cut this board because I have offset rips here, so I can't do them in one uh, pass. Um, but before I do let me let me just go over something I didn't mention when I was doing the layout work. I always leave a kerf. This is the thickness of a blade that you're going to waste. So when you're laying out your parts, you want to want to understand that you're going to lose, um, depending on the blade I use, up to an eighth of an inch for the kerf. Now, what I like to do, if it doesn't matter, um, is I like to, to lay out the kerf at a quarter inch. So why lay it out a quarter inch if you know you got an eighth inch blade? Well, this edge of the board isn't, neither of these edges are jointed yet. So when I put this through that cut, it may or may not travel a straight line. So I may be 
you know, off a little bit here or there. So I like to leave a quarter inch of a curve. Just gives me a little wander room in case this this, uh, this this cut is just a little bit crooked. I've got plenty of room. i got an extra half inch on all these boards to square them up later. But I still like to make sure that I play it on the safe side. So I'm going to pass on the... Um, Pass on the dust collector to save your ears a little bit. It'll be loud enough on the table saw, but let's make uh, let's make this cut. And back to this other board. We've got extra over here on that other board. And there is no sense ripping that any narrower than it has to be because I may not even use that on this project. And if so, I will leave myself the widest possible uh, board for another project. So I think I'm just going to cut this off now uh, and put it aside. If I need it, I can, I can work with it. If I don't, I'll have the largest board possible uh, in my stock. Let's make that cut. Let's get around to pulling some of those parts out of the uh, out of the board. Now the next step is to rip these uh, seven inch uh, fronts, backs, and sides out of this stock. All right, so I'm going to make a rip right here at seven inches. I laid this out so I've got seven and an eighth here, and the reason is before I can make a straight rip cut here, I've got to make sure that these edges are perfectly square. And to do that, we're going to put, to put it on the jointer. We're going to get a clean edge that is perfectly straight and 90 degrees to the face of the board. Then we'll put that reference face that we create against the table saw fence and we'll come to exactly seven inches uh, on the front. If we do them all at the same time, we make sure that the front, the back, and both sides are exactly the same height so that everything goes together well. To do that, we're going to head over to the jointer over here and uh, and get that that going uh, it's going to get noisy so I'll tell you in advance what I'm doing I'm putting the board through the jointer until I feel and until I hear an even cut all the way through the board meaning that the jointer has engaged every surface of that edge and it's a perfectly straight line because that fence on the jointer let me get over there Because the fence on the joiner is exactly 90 degrees to the, to the um, bed of the joiner, I know that my edge will not only be straight and true, but it will be at 90 degrees to the face of the board. So let me get set up for that and we'll do those cuts before we start ripping. Let me give you a little bit of an idea of what I was looking at as I was uh, feeding these boards through the jointer. Um, imagine, if you will, that this is the cutter head on the jointer turning in this direction 
with three cutters which will attack the wood. The grain on this board is coming off in this direction and falling off the end of the board. I think you can see that. Right. So if I feed the board this way, it's going to fight those cutters as they come up and it's going gonna, it's gonna to tear out the wood. So what I looked for was to feed the board in this direction. Right? Because now the grain is falling off the wood in this direction and as it goes over those cutters, it's feathering itself off nicely. It's not tearing out. So uh, grain direction is important when you are feeding uh, into the joiner. You want to look at the board, read the board, and, um, and, and do the best you can to avoid tear out. Uh, the truth of the matter is we got this going here and we're good. Well, you're going to find boards that are not this case and you're going to have the grain running off one way at one end of the board and one way at the other and, and there's just no way you can avoid it. But again, with, with everything, do the best you can uh, to even it out. Look at the grain direction so that as you're bringing this board through the joiner, the grain on the board is feathering off as it hits the, uh, the teeth of the joiner, the knives of the joiner. It gives you the best edge possible. Let's take those jointed edges to the fence now and rip the front, the back, and the sides to seven inches. The other thing I want you to know is just a little practice that I do, uh, you know, up to you. Whenever I take a board off the joiner and put it on a table saw, I put the jointed end towards the fence. Keeps my head in the right place. I remember which edge I join it. Uh, and don't accidentally pick it up and rip from the unjointed edge. Let's rip some boards. Okay, ripping on the table saw. Um, I've got my blade height set already from my earlier cut. I'm going to set my fence to 7 inches. Now, it's up to you how well you know your table saw and your fence, whether you care to measure that or not. I can tell you that I'm comfortable that that is 7 inches between the fence and the blade right now. So, what I want to do is get this jointed edge of the stock up against the fence and when I pass this through the table, I will have uh, my 7 inches. And frankly, if it's not 7 inches, it's not that important. I'll tell you why in a minute. All right, I'm going to skid out. Let me turn on the dust collector. I know it's noisy, sorry, but... Okay, so a couple things. One, um, safety is a matter of personal concern. Um, this table saw cannot be equipped with a riving knife. Knife, it's very old. Um, so I trust my experience to make safe cuts and avoid kickback. Um, there is a space between the blade and the fence of seven inches. I am very comfortable not using a push stick or device. Uh, if that's not the case uh, with you, I, I recommend you use whatever uh, push stick or device you think is appropriate uh, for making that cut. Um, you know, uh, again, safety is a matter of uh, uh, personal uh, uh, concern. Uh, I'll be honest, if I, if I had a uh, table saw with a riving knife, I would definitely use it. Again, these old jets, um, you know, there's, there's, no, there's no way to do it. And the splitters uh, are pretty much useless that, uh, that I can put on here. But that said, I've been doing this for over 30 years and uh, I'm pretty comfortable with this and I'm, I'm extremely, extremely careful. The reason I said that the distance between the fence and the blade uh, I, I trust to be 7 inches is because, you know, I've done this so long that, you know, uh, I just know my saw, right? So. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm at seven inches to the inside of that tooth right there, so it's good. But the, 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 the real important thing here 
is not that this is seven inches. That's not a critical dimension. It's a box. It's, it's going to be around nine inches by the time I put the lid on. But the important thing is these boards are exactly the same height. So if I was a 64th long or a 64th short, I wouldn't care too much because I would know that the front, back, and side of my box are exactly the same height and I'm going to get a nice square tight uh, um, uh, joinery out of this. That's the important thing, that you make your cuts for all the pieces at the same setting. The next thing we're going to do is square an end and start ripping off these pieces. And when we do so, I'll show you that we also want to use the same setting for each cut so that each side is the same length, each front and back is the same length, so that we have a perfectly square box in the end. And while you were gone, um, I ripped the, uh, the two inch wide pieces uh, as well. <coughs> Excuse me, so I've got my seven inch uh, piece that will be the box front, back, and sides, and I got my two inch pieces which will be the lid uh, that will open it, and the lid is two inches deep to accommodate those, those tools I mentioned. Um, so the reason I ripped them before I cross cut the, 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 the back and side and front is because I want to make sure that everything is cross cut to the same exact dimension. If the box is going to come up square and the top is going to fit to, to the box, then I want everything to be exactly the same size. So I want to set my cross cut up once and make all my cross cuts. So let, let's come over here a little bit. See if I can get this camera set for you so you get a good view. Uh, try to steady it up a little bit here and I'll show you this setup. So I use a cross cut fence. It's a Craig cross cut fence. There's, there's a couple of good ones out there. And it has a, a, a stop. And that stop will determine uh, the length of cut. So what I want to do is the width of my box will be, or the depth uh, um, or size of the box will be uh, eight inches total. So I want to make the side pieces seven and three quarters because it's going to be a rabbit, <coughs> excuse me, on, on the front and the back. So what I want to do is I want to find seven three quarters from the tip of the blade. And if you look at your table saw blade, you may have an alternate tooth bevel. So you want, to, you want to catch the tooth that is closest uh, to this way. Bring your fence over and slide it down until you are at seven and three quarters. I'm at seven and three quarters right there. And my rule is touching the blade so I can tighten this down. I lost a little bit. There is seven and three quarters. Okay, so I now know that if I put a board up to that stop and push it through the blade, I'm at seven and three quarters. So let me reset the uh, tripod because you guys are sitting up on the uh, sitting up on a table, so you'll vibrate like heck if I turn it on now. So let me reset a little bit and um, you know uh, get this going. I should let you vibrate because you forgot to tell me to turn on the camera when I was doing the two inch cross uh, rip cuts. Be right back. So before I cut my piece to length, I have to make sure that the other end is also square to the new uh, edges that I, that I jointed and ripped. So to do that, I'll make a, a cut on one end that I know will be 90 degrees, then I'll bring the piece back into that stop, cut it off, and I know it's at exactly 7 3 quarters. And then I'll have a new square end to work with, I'll flip that against the fence and I'll cut that one off and I'll repeat it with the wider board, with the seven inch board. So let's make those cuts. I'm going to make my first cut to get to 90. I might as well cut off the snipe at the same time.
Let's take a look at what we got. I have two sides that are exactly the same height and exactly the same length. I then have two sides for my lid that are exactly the same height and exactly the same length and they also match the sides that they'll go on top of. So by making one setup to cut all the pieces and you guys are in the shadows I think making one setup uh, to cut all the pieces uh, results in uh, what's going to be a nice uh, fitting box in the end. I'm going to go ahead and do the same process for the fronts and the backs. I'll do that off camera. You get the uh, you get the point. It's just going to be um, 18 inches long instead of six and three quarters long. It's going to be the same exact process. Well, that's starting to look like something now. I hope um, we can see the box uh, come into shape. It's just temporarily held together there uh, for sizing. But this is where most woodworking videos would start. We're going to build a box. And uh, for those of you who have stayed with me through the whole first sections of this video, thank you. I think it's important to, you know, understand what it takes to get to this point. You know, woodworking, uh, furniture making, it's not just about putting pieces together and, um, and, and, and making something. It, it's about the, the, the whole journey from, from the concept, from the idea. Right? And this is a very functional, practical idea. We want to, want to organize my electronics uh, that I use for uh, engine repair and stuff. And, and we, we, we want to build with purpose. So we designed around the need that we knew we had. Um, and then we took our rough stock and we figured out how we're going to deal with that, how we're going to mill that down, how we're going to bring it to a place where it could start becoming something like a box. And here we are right now. So thank you for indulging me thus far. Now we're going to get into making a box. You can see because I cut all my pieces from the same setup that I am perfect. I am perfect all around. I don't have any uh, bumpy here, bumpy here. We're, we're, we're going to be good. And because I cut the, uh, the, the top at the same exact time, we can see that that is also going to fit exactly uh, in line with the box. And we're going to have a really nice uh, piece of material here when we're done that, that we can be proud of. Um, nothing gappy, nothing crooked, nothing bent, nothing twisted. Um, we're going to get this into, uh, and I'm just kind of pressing that in place so you can get the idea. But you can see where the top's going to lay on the box. We're going to have some hinges back here. We're going to have a lid on this thing. We're going to have some catches on this thing. And this will open up very nicely uh, into a box. But before we do that, before we start putting this together, maybe I'll take you off tripod for this one and uh, apologize in advance for my uh, shaky hand if that's the case. But the sides are going to come into the, the front, not with a simple butt, uh, butt joint like that. We're going to make a rabbit. So we're going to let in the front something like this and this will move up into here and then we'll have glue and we'll nail it through this side uh, and hold the whole thing together. Uh, a little bit about uh, joinery. This is very basic joinery. Again, if this was a piece of uh, uh, furniture uh, we would be using dovetails, we would at least be using finger joints uh, to get a really good uh, um, uh, joint that's worthy of fine furniture. This is a utilitarian box <laughs> and we're not going to go through that trouble. We're going to use a, a glue and nail. Now when you glue long grain, which is at the end of this board, end grain to long grain right here, it's not a very strong glue joint. And we've got the same thing working in this direction, end grain will be going into long grain when this thing slides over. So we won't have a really strong glue joint. So that's why we're going to use mechanical fasteners. We're going to nail it through this side piece into here. So that nail will go through the side and into the board like that. And we'll have a mechanical fastening as well as a glue joint. And that's perfectly fine for uh, a piece like this. Again, wouldn't do that 
on a uh, on a chest of drawers <laughs> or on a table drawer, but but for the purpose of this box, that's a fine um, uh, a fine joint. Uh, I've done it a lot of times, and uh, you know um, we'll be we'll be just dandy with that. So let's get into figuring out how we want to cut those rabbits. This this joint here, this evacuation that's going to come out of this board is known as a rabbit. Uh, that's the that's the technical term. So we're going to figure out how we want to cut that and show you guys how it's done. <laughs> 